So thanks for coming out. Um, first of all, all my talks like uh, are kind of evolving. So this is probably, no, it's version number three of this talk. And I really rely on your feedback later. That means you can write me an email or follow me on Twitter. And I uh, really what, uh, look, would uh, like to hear what you want me to improve on the talk or topics uh, which were missing for you, okay? So um, the talk is called Performance Testing Sucks, which actually is like that. Performance testing is super hard. And the title, main title means how to get started testing RESTful APIs and GraphQL. And first question, who is using GraphQL in production? Three. Okay, who's using RESTful something? <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay, so how about me? Um, my name is Lars. Uh, you, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm the co-founder of Stormforger. We are um, a performance testing software as a service, which means you can uh, sign in and run load tests and performance tests with our platform. We do all the stuff around. I'll come to that a bit. Um, my background is software engineering. And um, I also became an agile hippie, I always call it, not coach, uh, because I had the problem years ago that I actually wanted to deliver software. And then I came back together with teams and we worked on that stuff, which made me like, yeah, m get more interested in this agile stuff. And further, I'm in love with the community. I'm organizing conferences myself and um, I do meetups in my home base, Cologne. All right, who likes Pac-Man? What's about the others? You, you know Pac-Man, right? <laughs> OK. So APIs are eating the world, is it? So I mean, so many people raised their hands when I was were asking, OK, there, there, do you put something with RESTful? And yeah, e APIs are eating the world. They're everywhere, like behind our websites, behind our mobile apps, uh, behind our washing machines, <laughs> behind our TV setup boxes, and so on, and so on, so on. You know that. And probably. Um, when at the back at the time when the people had the situation that they were talking about uh, REST, uh, REST services or web services and asked them how to do that, they came up with the thing REST. And that they thingy is actually one person, uh, one person called Feening. And he did a dissertation about architectures for web-based systems. This is not the original title. Um, however, um, he came up with the idea of REST, which is an architectural concept. And Probably REST comes along with, uh, or is more known to you with the, with the term hypermedia and haters. Who's actually using hypermedia stuff and the REST stuff? One, two. Okay. So um, hypermedia is just like hyperlinking, as we know it from HTML. And the concept behind that is haters, that you give the resource more related resources to it. And since uh, this is around for some years, um, we can have like pre uh, implementations or helpers for building REST APIs for pretty much every um, development framework in every language. Um, yep. So a bit, um, there's a bit misunderstanding, but please keep in mind that it's an architectural concept. And REST all in all means like it's a representation of resources with all its re um, properties and probably with linked or related resources to that. You see this probably on, most of the time um, on, a, on your daily basis, right? And then something funny happened. <laughs> so Feeling was talking about REST and came up with this idea, and we started implementing it. And then we started finger pointing. We were saying, you do not do REST because it's not fully 100% complete REST. And then the whole uh, developer community came up with the term REST fall, which means we try to be as REST as possible, right? So. Uh, Whoever had this discussion, you don't do REST, you are RESTful or not? <laughs> yeah. So I, whenever I think about that, I get uh, really amused about this thing. However, so doing REST is easy. Like you set up, a, uh, for example, a GET request to a resource. This resource here is peoples. And I have an ID for that. I exactly want the data for this one resource. And I get something back which looks like this. It's a JSON document. You can even get back XML, as I mentioned before. And we have all the information about this person. You're fam familiar with that thing, right? And then, pretty new, something new came up, which is called GraphQL. And GraphQL has a shiny logo. And this is actually what happens when you search for a logo for REST. 
so there's no logo because back in that days nobody was thinking about make it a, like a, a product thingy or give it that that stuff of marketing. And the history of REST uh, of GraphQL is that Facebook initially started that in 2012 as a project called Supergraph when they realized they have to have the the need for their client developers the ability to request all the data they actually really need. And that was the same time when they were starting with all the, the open graph stuff, doing, bringing that public, when they realized, okay, all our data is structured as a graph system. So, you know, this thing like, my connection to my friend, to my friend, and we share something, and we have connections, is like a, a big graph system. And the thing on GraphQL is, it's a query language to your API. And they're self-saying on their website, you can query your API to get all just the data you actually need. And they also claim that they, you have the possibility to, get, uh, to, to just get the, uh, the right uh, thing you actually want to in the right format, and so you can do involving APIs. And they're kind of addressing something which happens to, to you when you build a uh, REST API, because you will at some point have the problem how to do versioning and how to do have different formats. Who's using filters and formats in the REST APIs? F so many people. <laughs> okay. So, but the a nice thing on GraphQL is that you can create a query which looks like this. We're asking for the same ID, the same person. We're asking for the concrete properties. We're asking for uh, like connections. Uh, the home world, for example, and there you can see the, the uh, graph thingy. Um, we're asking the, the film connection, please go traverse all the edges and give me back the nodes. And to fire that up, you do something like this. Does not look that nice anymore, but you basically put in the query, you will en encode it as a get parameter, uh, as a get payload to your graph um, endpoint. Um, the guys who um, doing that stuff like GraphQL, who's actually have like these query requests seen before, on even longer ones. You, okay. So good thing is that if you have the picture in mind how we do, how we created the query, um, you get back a representation in the same order as you actually asked the, the API, which is a nice thing as a, as a client developer, right? I can say I want that and that and that and that in this order, and I directly get that is this in the same order back. And then the interwebs is saying, GraphQL is the new REST. You heard that? Do you have the opinion that GraphQL is the new REST? Okay, I ask myself the question, are these both things even comparable? And I came to, to the conclusion, nay. And I mentioned some stuff of that before, but um, if you look up the net and ask and check what the people are commenting on that, um, then you realize that there's a lot of discussion around this and a lot of different perspective and nothing of that is really wrong. But I really like one article by a guy called Sturgeon who did a sum up, okay, is this really the new rest or and give an overview to REST and, and GraphQL. And he's saying GraphQL is not a ma a magic, uh, any magic bullet. Do you think that? I will ask a lot, a lot of questions, sorry. <coughs> okay. And further, he's saying, as always in technology, it's nice if you, if you use it for the right thing. I mean, this is what, what we always hear, it depends. It's nice if you use it for the right thing and really think about what you're doing there. But in, com in the comparison, he's saying, okay, REST and GraphQL are actually totally different things. And I gave you that just in the beginning. REST is an architectural concept, while GraphQL is a query language with some specification around and a bit of, of tool set. Okay? Now, performance testing. What's the problem? Is who, who of you has performance problems? <laughs> <laughs> the people who did not raise their hand, do you uh, just don't want to expose that you have ex performance problems or are you super fast? Okay. However, I mean, we should not have performance problems because, I mean, we can bring our stuff to the cloud. And if we bring it, the cloud will scale infinite, right? So there, the cloud will do that job. 
and however, stuff still breaks, and somebody is searching for the reasons. <laughs> and yeah, if you think about that, what really is the problem? It's not that thing about technology at all. It's about that we just build super complex uh, systems on an everyday basis. And we bring them to environments which we don't know. I mean, we build that on our local machine. We probably have like a staging environment or an integration environment where we test that stuff and check it out. But then it's going to a new environment called this production thing. And there's stuff different. Stuff there, the stuff which is different there is, for example, they are real users. And they probably don't behave like we, we had this in our requirements. Mm. And of course, we have side effects. And yes, we have bugs. And this is pretty normal. Like most of the day, or most of the time of our days, it's like searching for bugs or fixing stuff that we did not expect, right? Who had the nice job that you only build new features? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> However, how can performance testing help me with that thingy? So, Performance testing is like it's a it's a set of testing methods to actually yeah um, create load um, a workload and bring it to the system and stimulate the system like that uh, with the workload and learn about the behavior of the system itself. And with that, you can like easily check out characteristics of the system, what you actually expect, and if this is right or wrong. And further, you actually can learn about the system and the behavior. This is like the most important thing. When we bring stuff to production, we think it behaves like in our requirements, we then recreated it, but it won't. There will be differences, and differences are all over. I mean, I don't want to get in that detail, but it's like from the software versions to like, I don't know, networking in the environment where you are. And there's a lot of testing methods around. The probably most known testing methods are like stress testing, right? So people, when they think about performance testing, they think about, okay, we need the stress test where we really burn down this cluster. But this is not the point. The point is like, there's a lot of other testing methods around to actually learn about the behavior of your system. And this is like super complicated to get started with. And that's the reason why I started this talk about like, okay, how I actually do performance testing. What is the what is the, the stuff we are, or the task we actually have to do? And further, what's the things we have to take care of, even in the scope today of RESTful and CraftQL? And this is like it's kind of like two stories because we have customers who start testing CraftQL and some things are different. And this is a, a thing for me that I'm interested in that how these people behave when they build their system and even what's the performance impact. Yeah, so what do we have to do to do performance testing? First of all, it seems like pretty easy. Set a goal, create a test case, run the test, and look at the results. Who's doing something like that? Like, who's from Q QA anyway, or testing? The others are developers? Okay. But if you really check it out, you, s you realize that you have to do a lot, a lot, a lot of more stuff. Then I come over and we'll read this, like we have to set goals, set non-functional requirements, plan tests, create test definition, provision test uh, resources, set up and deploy the test cases, execute the test, monitor the running test, tear down the test environment, gather and analyze log data, do the interpretation of the test results, probably do evaluation, probably we will find something, probably we have to fix it, then we start over to check if this fix actually works. So this is more than these four points. The four points are probably the management slide. We just have to take, make it, have a go to the test and so This is the actual work you need. And this is like complicated. So the people from Q QA, do you think like um, this is like easy task for you? Yes or no? <laughs> hmm. Okay, to do a performance test, you obviously, because we're creating load, you need something like a load generator. And there are load generators out there. And the probably most known is JMeter, which is, which is a Java tool. And then there's Gatling, which is Scala. And there was also a Gatling talk yesterday. I actually missed that because I just arrived yesterday in the evening. And then there's Sung, and there are even more. But these things, these load generators, just give you the load. You still have to do all the other stuff around. And to, to deal with all this other stuff around, you can use like, yeah, tools like, for example, Stormforger, which does help you by provisioning the, all the resources you need and running the tests and so on and so on. I will show you about, a bit about that later. 
Yeah. So um, actually, who's who want to? Who is in the situation that you actually have to analyze your performance problems from those people who have performance problems? And how business critical is that? So is that something like you have to fix that in two weeks, or is that something you have to fix in like six months? <laughs> or is. <laughs> okay, how are you? let's do this. So you probably realized I, I'm using the, the Star Wars data set. Um, because, like, first of all, it's public. Secondly, we we all like Star Wars. Third, the GraphQL uh, demos are in, Craft, in, in the Star Wars data set, and it's pretty nice to just to work on that. The first thing we have to do is like, oh no, I hate that. The first thing that we have to do is like setting test goals. And to do a goal, we first of all have to ask ourselves what we, what do we want actually to test. And this thing is called like user journey or customer journey in the in the sense of the uh, e-commerce business, for example. And I'm saying, okay, our user journey is we're fans of Han Solo, so please get the data about Han Solo and find like the episode he appeared in. And my main goal is that I want to have this application thingy, this API, like scaling super infinite, without any violation of my non-functional requirements. Who's dealing with non-functional requirements in the in the business? Yep. One, two, three, four. This is too less. <laughs> um, so I define two non-functional requirements. I'm saying like mostly all of the requests should be in under one second. And further, uh, I define another requirement, which is saying like I want to have like all the the films or episodes. I want to have them in under 500 milliseconds. Now we have to create a test case definition. The test case definition is actually that what you, where you describe, okay, this is the scenario which the, the journey runs through and what actually will create the load. And at Stormforger, you have a, a JavaScript DSL to describe this, this uh, definition. You're basically just saying, hey, do that request, do that request, do that request with a lot of options around that. And it looks like this. And I'm sorry, it's always hard to show code, code on slides, but I mean, it's... Basically, just like you have the session, and you're saying, okay, please get me the person, Han Solo. We actually know before that we have a, that, that um, his ID is 14. We um, get data back there. Remember the response I showed you before? We extract like the films there, the next URLs, and we follow these URLs of these next requests. So all in all, we're doing five requests here for this thing, right? And the same for GraphQL would be look, look something like this. Like you have uh, the query where we're saying, okay, give me please this human with ID 14, and we have properties here, and show me where he appears in, and then we do some convenience around, get rid of some stuff we don't need, and we put it in here as a parameter, okay? And this is just one request. And then we start a test run, which is like probably the most boring part and even so most interesting part of uh, performance testing. First of all, you just look on the screen and waiting for a test to be ready. And this can be long, like hours. On the other side, at the same time, you want to check out your own system. You check your own system monitoring, you check your logs, you probably yeah, check out like networking stuff and firewalls and so on. And just learn about what's going on there. And then you will get like, um, of course, reports, and this is like a major task which we, we see often outside in the world. I'm not saying that the people don't do good reports, but all the report, reports that the people do, they are like completely different. And it's super hard to decide what kind of data you will get. Uh, this report is not this, uh, that super important right now, but I just want to show, okay, it's super important for you that when you create tests and that when you rerun them, that your report is always the same so that you actually can compare the results. And I've saw, saw people that are sending like just like numbers every night per, by email to themselves. And I saw people who created their like super sophistical statistical report with like, I don't know, bringing back the data um, to graphite and do even more stuff on that. Yeah. So um, in terms of our test here, um, we actually are interesting in the timings because this is what our non-functional requirements were saying. And then you, because I gave them names, so this is the request of Han Solo, this is the request of all his films, and then there's the one request of the GraphQL query. And by the way, um, the numbers, I mean, this is just a test and an example. I'm not saying here that GraphQL is slower, even if it looks like this on this uh, example here, but you cannot say that per se. 
um, the most important thing here is in terms of our non-functional requirements that we want to look at the 99th percentile. So this means that 99% of all requests are uh, responded in under 500, uh, 555 milliseconds. And with that, we can see, first of all, that we actually we missed our non-functional requirement of no of all the requests should be slower than one second because we have 1,800 milliseconds here. On the other side, I was asking in the second uh, non-functional requirement that I want to have films here in, uh, in under 500, and we missed that. Uh, no, we don't did miss that because we added 420 here. Okay, and. As you see right now, because when I look in your faces, you, it seems like you're kind of lost. And this is what actually happens at performance testing, because like, it's super complicated to have the interpretation of all this data. And we just did like three different types of requests here. We're not talking about a system with like hundreds or thousands of requests. Like, I mean, this table will be long as, I don't know, from Hamburg to Cologne. <laughs> um, yeah. So this is hard. How? However, so what is the problem with uh, GraphQL and, and RESTful, and is there even one? So what to consider in terms of performance? So the first thing is that this stuff is just like, it's different. And it's not like you cannot say, okay, we are faster with that, or it's better for us. You just like, you have to always think about your problem scope. And first thing is that, and I showed that in the test definition, um, I mean, we do less requests, because in enough implementation of this RESTful API, we did five requests for just like a little part of data. In GraphQL, we just do one request, and less requests is, per is good per se. However, on the other side, that means that you probably play, uh, you can blow up payloads, because you do one request with this, this super query where you ask for all the data, and this can be slow, because the backend has to collect all the data and bring it back to the client. And secondly, it's a thing of isolation. So at the RESTful part, we could clearly see, OK, the request Han Solo, the request Films. And we can like, bring them in buckets and have the data for that. For GraphQL, it's like, super complicated, because like, the, the number you get, it's, um, it's the whole query you created. That means your non-functional requirements, if they get technical, you actually have to be super explicit in saying, OK, my non-functional requirement for this GraphQL um, request must be exactly that query. And that brings you at the point when you see, OK, by collecting the data, it's getting slower, that at one point you have to search for, for all the connections in this example films and find out, OK, how can I isolate films from that? And this means basically you have to create a new, a new test scenario, which means you just uh, GraphQLing um, the, the, films, uh, the films part. That um, means, but, but that means that you actually start an experiment because nobody will ask films alone, right? So now it's getting like statistically wrong. Even in a rebirth scenario, it's wrong. It's not comparable to anything. You just can learn about the behavior, nothing more. <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm a bit ill because like I'm, I'm on conferences thing since I don't know four days now or so. <laughs> um, I was talking about the request before, but. Yeah, I mean, it's super complicated that you yeah, have this in mind. What is actually the journey, and what does that mean for my careers there? And next thing is that in, there's a lot of discussion about caching of GraphQL, because like um, at RESTful, because it's, you use the UL scheme, you can basically profit from all the HTTP caching, caching me mechanisms. That means the client's cache is automatically like proxies in the internet will cache it, and you can, it's a lot of, we know a lot of stuff about caching H, normal HTTP requests in the backends. This is like more complicated for GraphQL because like, it's like, you must invalidate all the data, and it's more complicated because like you, you're probably all your requests are all totally different because of the query thing. It's not just like this one, this one request, which is cacheable. It's like getting complicated because of the query. And even so, please remind yours, yourself that, for example, like proxies in the internet, not all these, these uh, machines are able to have super long URLs with long parameters. And even firewalls don't like that stuff at, at some place. <coughs> and yeah, I forgot to mention that. 
So when you do a backend cache, a caching in your backends, like we always look looking at the hit rate, right? We have like cache buckets where we say, okay, these are these requests or these types of requests, and we have this uh, cache buckets there, and then we look at the hit rate. For GraphQL, we you will have a lot. You will spread to a lot of buckets, and of course, like in some, your hit rate is the same, but in the it's super hard then to distinguish, okay, what is the right cache right now? Is it really used? And is the hit rate the right one? And secondly, it's super hard to invalidate that. Because at that point, when you, when you recreate, um, well, recreate your schema of GraphQL, then you're at the, at the, in the situation that you actually have to tell all those cache buckets, okay, you must invalidate right now, which means like uh, it's, uh, it will, you, will have get, you will get the traffic to your backend system. And this is complicated. Whose problems with caching? Yep, caching is hard. All right, and there's another thing like when we do, I mean, we do testing not bef just to have the numbers, we do this testing stuff to actually find out what to improve. And searching for these improvements and do optimizations is hard anyway because at that point we have to deep dive in the code. Uh, in RESTful architectures, it's often so that you have like kind of isolated system where you say, okay, these endpoints using these microservices or, or I don't know, like these data aggregates and so on, and you can check out the systems. At GraphQL, it's like that. You have the GraphQL endpoint, and behind that is there's the schema definition, and you have to be aware how, to, how the schema definition will go back to the other backends, which means to clearly see what you're actually doing there, you actually really need request tracing. And as we all know, it's super hard to have like the perfect monitoring and have request tracing and have like the insights and all this data. And <coughs> further, further, um, there's like, um, when I was talking about this isolation thing, you can do that with, with routing, you can improve that with, root, with routing, and you, in RESTful system, it's often so that old versions are rooted to the old data center, new versions, they're rooted in the new data center or in the cloud. And this is easy manageable because like you have, again, HTTP URIs. For GraphQL, you have to do that in the schema, which means like you build something like in gateway, and it's hard to manage a gateway, I think. Okay. In the abstract, I mentioned the complete guide to performance testing. And I hope right now that I um, showed you until now that the complete guide to performance testing is super complicated. And this is the worst slide in my deck. And I will not read it. And also, I'm not 100% sure if it's really the complete guide. Because like, there's one thing, I was tired because I was tired to write all these things down. It's so hard. Sehr gut. <laughs> so, um, another question is now, when you change something, when to choose RESTful or when to choose GraphQL? And yeah, somebody said that. As always, it depends. But as far as I learned and what I see out, uh, out there in the world, it's a decision from a product perspective. And you really have to ask yourself, if you, if you do something which is like, um, on a client side, super, super complicated, then GraphQL totally makes sense. If you have something where you have like super hard um, uh, yeah, computation and a lot of services involved, then probably RESTful still is the thing to go because like you have, we have all this, this, uh, um, this ideas of like service contracts and we have like the, the experience of 15 years and probably if you talk to each other, you, you're facing the same problems and you did that in the last years. And it's pretty hard with the new technology. And as I said, again, this is an architectural concept for a concrete solution of your architectural problem, where GraphQL just gives you the stuff to the client side and for the client engineers. So if somebody asked me today, where, what should we do, Lars? We're creating this, this thing, and I need this API. I would say something that, OK, if you have this heavy, super heavy client, uh, client side thingy, then you're probably the fastest to go right now when you use something like GraphQL or when you use GraphQL. Because like you can decide decide for yourself what data you need and you can be faster and build that stuff. But be aware that when you get when you grow bigger and when it, when you kind of stale out, that you will have problems in the back end. This will be a communication problem, not a techno technology problem. Like you really have to talk to the people, okay, make this scaling better for me and give me back this data. And on the other side, as mentioned before, like if it's, if it's a complex architecture or a, bit, a complex like computing business thing, then RESTful is still the, the, the way to go. 
And now, of course, we end at the question that you always have to ask yourself, okay, what is the problem I actually want to solve? And at that point, when um, I mean, we're asking that a lot, but um, I often see that people, and this is what happened to REST and REST4, like the people who start, okay, we don't want to do any normal web, web services anymore. We start with REST, and then they forget about the, real Im the whole implementation, and then they started arguing and finger pointing, and we, ca we came to RESTful, but they got used to use that stuff. And on the other side, in, uh, for GraphQL, sometimes it seems, okay, I want to use GraphQL because yeah, it's there, and it's nice, and Facebook is doing that. And this is probably, like, in a decision like this, the biggest thing that you actually should ask yourself, do I really have, like, the same problems like the Facebooks and, and the GitHubs? Because, like, as I mentioned in the very beginning, Facebook did that stuff because they have hundreds of client developers who actually rely on that, that they get the data to bring out their products, and they easily have, like, another hundred developers uh, if not thousands, <laughs> on the backend side to create that stuff. And so they can do decoupling for like this, this in, in their organizations. And yeah, I'm not sure if like in the normal companies uh, we actually facing this proble problem on an everyday basis. All right, so this, I will I always end with questions. I mean, like with a slide like question, I'm pretty sure that you can easily ask yourself and answer that you're Maybe not Facebook and maybe not GitHub, but probably you are in large organizations, and then this makes sense. And that's it. So um, for me, it's still super important that I get feedback to the talk, to the content, and so on. And it's super important for me that we probably now for 50 minutes start a bit uh, of discussion why, for example, the people who digged into GraphQL decided for GraphQL and what's interesting for them, and even so, what's about the other people, what, f what kind of problems you're actually facing with, with RESTful. Thanks, first of all. <laughs> Any questions? If not, I have a lot. <laughs> Okay, as I said, like the guys who, who digged in GraphQL, what is the reason why you decided for that? Who was that? Somebody here. Somebody of you were using GraphQL, right? <laughs> so three people uh, showed up and using GraphQL. You, okay, so what is the, what's the reason why you decided for GraphQL? Thank you very much. Uh, the dynamism for the responses uh, of the uh, API itself, mm -hmm. so you can ask for different information, and it's quite easy to create new endpoints, uh, especially when you are defining the, the full implementation. And when you want to have a cache implementation, that you can, in the backend, you can have Graph GraphQL, but at the end, you can use it through a REST uh, endpoint. So yeah. you can have both in the same code, if you want cache or things like that. Yeah. And um, I mean, how do you how do you deal with the thing that like the GraphQL level, uh, the GraphQL layer will give you like kind of single point of failure because it acts like a gateway? How do you deal with that? So you have like you have the, the layer of GraphQL where you define the schema. This is talking to all the other services to collect the data, and this like builds us in another single point of failure because it acts like a gateway. You have to super scale that thing, and it must be able to scale out. So how to deal with that? Because I'm serious, I have no idea how to deal with that. So but that's the reason I'm asking. Okay. Hmm. Do you have any questions? No questions, always bad. <laughs> okay, who's doing performance testing on a regular basis? One person? Why don't you do it? So the, the people with the performance problems, how do you solve these problems? Huh? Say it again. You don't solve them. <laughs> okay, so the performance does not have any business impact or you, you just say, I don't, we don't care, we need features. <laughs> Basically, I uh, I didn't say we don't solve that. I say they don't solve that. Okay. People who don't reply. 
yeah. But but we, we don't do regular uh, performance testing. But since we need to do that, we do it uh, from time to time, but not in a regular, uh, I would say, uh, academic fashion. But uh, as you pointed out, we need it for the business to run, so we need to do that. Yeah. Yeah, doing like... The situation you're explaining is like the, the normal stuff we realize at customers. So a lot of people start performance testing when they have an actual serious problem. And um, with serious problem, um, I mean stuff like the systems is going down on a regular basis in the sense of every two hours or so. Or guess what? Uh, Black Friday is happening and the people expect a lot of traffic at e-commerce. And... Um, this is probably be like as always the worst thing you can do. Like you can, you should learn all this information you need about the, like the behavior of your system, even in terms of performance, on a regular basis. Then you're in the position to act with stuff like, okay, we need this and these features, and your product owner can help you to like prioritize even stories about performance optimization because you know you, you will learn that you have like we have this and this headroom until we go down or until we. Yeah, we violate our non-functional requirements. But it's, it's kind of human. We are super bad and doing stuff regularly forever. Like, like it's like these regular meetings, we have them. The first six meetings are fine. The seventh, eighth, tenth, hmm. We'll see some people don't come there or won't come there and so on, so on. So it is super hard for us. That's the reason why, I mean, we all have tools and software for that because like, if you have like software who is doing this for you, like with an API call or or with a, even with just a hit on a button, and you just do not care, you just see the results, then this is probably better. All right. So last thing. So this is like in this talk. Uh, first of all, I wanted to make clear that RESTful and GraphQL are different things, and you cannot say this one is faster or not. And this is like I know high level stuff. But it's like usually a, no, a big discussion about this. And now there's another talk going on in Cinema 8, I think, where Bernd and Julian will talk about uh, how actually they implemented GraphQL and what, the, what kind of lessons, th lessons they learned. So if you're interested in GraphQL, then please join them later. Thank you very much.